All right, hello everybody, and welcome to today's JFK Junior Forum at the Institute of Politics in honor of Hispanic and Latin Heritage Month. So my name is Luis Esteban Suedo. I'm a first year representative at the Institute of Politics, helping the class of 2024 explore opportunities in politics and public service at Harvard. I'm currently planning on studying government and economics, and I live in Gray's Hall right on the yard. So today we'll be exploring the wide diversity within the Hispanic voting blog the varying political journeys, and the impact that the Hispanic and Latin community as the largest minority voting group with about 32 million registered voters will have on the 2020 election. In addition, we are seeing record numbers of Hispanic and Latin candidates running for office this year. The topic of this forum is really important to me because in addition to recognizing the influence of Hispanic and Latin community, Something that is often far more overlooked is the fact that there are so many different paths within it, both political and otherwise. So for example, my great grandparents immigrated from Cuba to New York and worked tirelessly, helping to build the NYC subway system as well as ships for World War II. My grandpa immigrated illegally from fascist Spain and became an entrepreneur, all the while having to postpone his wedding in Cuba due to Castro's revolution. And I myself was born in Cozumel, Mexico coming to the United States for the first time at the age of five. So my background has really helped me understand that just, just a few of the many different trajectories that may, members of our community go through. But most importantly, that Hispanic or Latin can mean so many different experiences, so many different cultures, so many different languages to so many different people, and that it's really hard to treat the community as a monolithic block. So on that note, tonight's discussion is moderated by Jorge Vasquez Jr an IOP Fall Fellow, as well as the Director of the Power and Democracy Program with the Advancement Project. He'll be in conversation with Melissa Mark Viverito, the former interim president of the Latino Victory Project and former speaker of the New York City Council District 8 for El Barrio slash East Harlem and the South Bronx, as well as Kenneth Romero, the Executive Director of the National Hispanic Caucus of State Legislators. So with that said, Mr. Vasquez, I'll pass it off to you for a great discussion. Thank you, Luis. It's a pleasure. And thank you so much for sharing that powerful story. Uh, and thank you all at home for viewing and joining us during Latinx Heritage Month. Uh, let's, get, let's get started. Welcome, Melissa. Welcome, Kenneth. Gracias por estar aquí. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, let's get follow up on what Luis said. Uh, when you think of 32 million eligible voters and you think of the Latinx community, I'm reminded, I was sharing with you offline of my great grandmother. My great grandmother lived to 111 years old, uh, passed away in 2004. So it's estimated that she was born in 1894, which would put her at about five years old uh, when the US invaded Puerto Rico, right? And, and my great grandmother, whose picture is behind me, she has like a, a scarf on her head for those who have better vision than me. Uh, she always reminded us of our Puerto Rican roots, but that our roots are multicultural and that afro Rican, right? That I went to your house and listen, it didn't matter. Always bedición to this day. You know, I make sure that the culture continues on. Uh, so to those who think the Latinx community is monolithic, what, what do you say to them? Uh, and we'll start off with Melissa. Look, that's always been... The, the, the problem, right? And, and thank you so much for the invitation to, to this forum and this conversation. And I look forward to the questions. That's always been uh, the issue of trying to just like lump all of us together, right? But when you look at this nation uh, and across the country, right? What the, the migration and where it has settled and where we're seeing the growth of the Latino community. But my situation in particular, for instance, as a Puerto Rican, born and raised in Puerto Rico, uh, we are a colony of the United States, invaded in 1898. Colonization is oppression, and so that is my perspective and the lens uh, through which I view the world, right? And um, of the migrations of the Puerto Rican community uh, have settled in, in obviously primarily the East Coast, but you find us in Texas, in California, in Ohio, uh, in Chicago. So, uh, and, and so the issue is that in this cycle, as we talk about, and now we obviously have one Democratic candidate and we have a vice presidential candidate alongside him uh, running, how do you communicate effectively, right, with the diversity that exists? And there has been 
um, some challenges, right? We have heard mixed messages about Biden and how he's communicating with Latinos, but we are seeing that the messaging now is starting to change. You don't run an ad in a Latino, in a Puerto Rican community, the same way you would run that ad in a Mexican American community, right? The cultural references are different. Um, there's different nuances uh, in the idioms, et cetera. Uh, so that has to be understood to effectively mobilize and motivate uh, people to vote and to go to the voting booth. So that has been part of the challenge. Um, um, the last thing I'll say on this is that, you know, one of the things in the primary that Bernie Sanders was able to do, he was the one candidate in the Democratic primary that most effectively energized the Latino vote because he put the energy, the time, he had a senior advisor who very much focused on this, was a Latino, a consultant, um, and was able to really understand that we were not monolithic and therefore was able to really energize the base of Latino voters and most effectively move them more so than any other Democratic candidate. So that's what people have to understand um, is that we have to, speak, have to speak to us in different ways and that you can't assume that we all gonna respond the same way to that one message. I love that you highlighted that because at an early age, when I first started practicing law, uh, I, I learned that Orita for someone from Central America was way different than for Boricuas, right? Like Orita meant later uh, at home. Uh, Orita for someone from Central America means right now. So even something as simple as one little phrase could change depending on what Latinx community you're talking about. Uh, and, and Kenneth, you know, you're you're in charge of the largest Latinx caucus there is in the country, 42 states, Puerto Rico. Uh, what's what's the signal there? Like, what do you say to to your members who who are trying to get their point across around we're all not the same? Yeah, but it's, it's precisely that we are not a monolithic community. We come from different perspectives, different backgrounds, different experiences, different reasons why we all uh, are here in this country, right? Uh, whether it was because parents immigrated, uh, immigrated from you know Cuba or from Spain, as uh, Reese was mentioning, or from uh, Central America, right? Escaping different situations like climate change and political regimes, uh, but also people that were already here and the border crossed them, right? Uh, you know, from a very personal perspective, I, my experience is that of being a, a son of a, a World War II POW that was captured by the Nazis, right, and tortured for two years and a half, right, and and I was born and, and raised in Brooklyn, uh, you know, the son of blue collar workers, uh, and and so that experience is completely different, right? I I didn't have an immigration experience, so to speak, but. You know, my family's from Puerto Rico. I then moved to Puerto Rico, and that is, there's there's a concept of a foreign country within U.S. soil uh, in many respects, right? That makes it so different. So, so it's important for uh, for us to understand that, but also to understand that we are not monolithic, also on the issues that are important to us as a community, right? Oftentimes uh, people think that uh, Hispanics are solely focused on issues around immigration. And I'm sure we'll talk about some of the issues that are important to Hispanic voters in this election uh, that show the wide array of issues that are important to us and the wide array of issues that our state legislators are involved and in leading in their state capitals. You know what, you, you teed up the next question really well for me. Uh, the Pew Research Center recently came out with a report around the changing racial and ethnic composition of the U.S. electorate. And looking at, you know, one third of voters this election cycle are going to be, are going to be, you know, people of color. Uh, we're expected to have 22 million voters for the first time who are naturalized citizens. Right. And, and often people look at people of color and automatically think Democrat. Right. What what message, if any, do you have to individuals who who take the Latinx vote for granted or that would say, you know, uh, it's automatically if you let a lot Latino register to vote, that person is going to vote Democrat. Uh, maybe we could start with Melissa, if that's OK. So, so to just so I want to expand a little bit on that Pew research because I think it's important, especially for those that are watching, since um, this is such a, the most important election 
in my lifetime, I'm sure it is for those who are watching, but this is the first time here in 2020 where Latinos are going to be the largest voting bloc, right? That doesn't necessarily mean, and, and hopefully we will be the largest to vote as well, right? So, so it's about the, the, and it's not only about eligible voters, the percentage of voters that actually do vote, right? That's important, but we are the largest voting block in this election cycle. So think about the power that our community has if we fully exercise the power that we have to vote, right, for those who are eligible to vote. And like you were saying, so 13% of those eligible voters uh, was, I'm sorry, it's 13% of eligible voters will be Latino this cycle. It was 9% in 2008. So there has been a growth, but obviously we have to go further than that. 12% um, of eligible voters are African American, and there will be about 11 million Asian American voters. Meanwhile, the the share of white eligible voters is going down, and that's why we're seeing the Republicans so aggressively implementing these voter suppression tactics because they know, right? The writing is on the wall. But the issue, you know, it is about flexing that muscle because of that voting block, the percentage that have been going to the voting booth um, has not been as high as it should. And we haven't seen the growth as much as we would like to. So that's why it's important for those of us that are working in the political sphere um, to really work and push candidates um, to be able to speak directly to our community. So think about the power of it. Unfortunately, I think too much. Um, it's important to be clear about our identity. I am very proud Puerto Rican, but I'm a coalition builder as well. But at the same time, I feel too much that the conversation is too black and white. You know, and that a lot of times we're being left out of conversations or perspectives or points of views, or maybe the significance and the importance of our vote is oftentimes taken for granted, like you're indicating. So we have to be very clear and push candidates that they have to speak to our communities and not take us for granted, right? Speak to our issues as an activist moving the Puerto Rico agenda and trying to talk about a process of self-determination for Puerto Rico. That's the message that we've been trying to send to the Biden campaign and to other candidates. That's an issue that is important uh, to our community, for instance. Thank you. <clears throat> Kenneth, do you have anything you would like to add to that? Sure, I couldn't agree more with Melissa. I mean, the reality is that we are already a, an, an incredibly powerful force uh, to be reckoned with but only if we went out to vote in the numbers that we are, right? We are currently, for this election, the numbers went up since 2016 dramatically in terms of eligibility of voters. It's gone up from 27 million to 32 million, right? right? And But we cannot be mistaken by seeing, if, if we look at the total numbers of Latinos voting in each election cycle, that number goes up, but that's because of the sheer growth of the population. So there's nothing to be... Uh, to celebrate, you know, just by that sheer number, if we see it plateauing in terms of the percentage, right? We need to realize the potential there is in the Latino vote and making sure that Latino voters understand the importance of going out to vote. We are already in, in if you look at it more granularly, right? If you go to New Mexico, for example, we are the highest uh, voting bloc in that state and in many congressional districts as well. Uh, but then there's places like, and I'll give you an example, Wisconsin, wh which is a state that you don't necessarily associate like with, with, a, with a large Latino uh, population. But when you look at elections and the impact that Hispanic, the Hispanic community could have, it's just eye-opening, right? Uh, in 2016, Hillary lost by 20,000 votes. That's it, 20,000 votes. She lost Wisconsin. Boricuas alone, Puerto Ricans, you know how many in Wisconsin eligible voters? 60,000, right? So if there had been a better outreach of that vote, of that just the Boricuas living in Wisconsin, that could have been a game changer. And that's what's important is the, in this election, is making sure that those 32 million go out and vote. And also to add, if I could just quickly, on, on looking back at the, at the, the statistics, because I know a lot of probably young people are watching, that in this cycle, Generation Z, which is you know, categorized as 18 to 23 years of age, is going to comprise 10% of voters in this election cycle. They were 4% in 2016. 
that has jumped dramatically. And that category of young people in this country right now is extremely diverse. So it's predominantly people of color. Um, so those are issues about like the power of the youth vote. You know, the young people are really um, organizing, are really feeling compelled, right, between climate change and some other key issues, gun safety, um, uh, not gun safety, you know, gun, gun reform and gun control laws. Those are issues that really matter to them. And you're seeing a level of energy among young people um, historic numbers. And so this year is going to be incredible. Already with early voting, we're seeing a historic turnout. They're projecting that this presidential uh, election cycle may be the, the highest since the beginning of the 1900s in terms of the number of people that go out and vote. Already close to 6 million people have, vote, have, start, have, vote, have voted in early voting, uh, which is considerably higher than where we were at this point back in, um, in the last election. So it's, it's, a, it's an incredible moment. We just can't, as Latinos, uh, be left out of the conversation. And we've got a force um, uh, that the candidates and this administration, well, Democrat Party, for my case, um, is really speaking to our issues in a comprehensive way. Yeah, and you mentioned uh, an amazing point talking about Gen Z. If we look at Gen Z, the 18 to 23 year olds, and then we look at early millennials, we're, we're looking at the largest voting block, right? And, and when I see that, I see hope, uh, especially because you hit the nail on the head, Melissa. You mentioned that uh, they understand diversity. They understand justice. They understand social justice. They're the ones who are organizing, quite frankly, right now and protesting every day. They're the ones who are unequivocally mentioning what's on their mind, but they're registering to vote and they've been slowly coming out to vote, right? And one of the things that, that I, I firmly believe is that voting is a learned experience, right? It, it really takes a village. It takes that friend tapping the other friend to remind them, hey, are you registered to vote? Hey, let's vote. Hey, let's have a family that votes together. And, and despite 32 million eligible Latinx voters, we still have a significant gap between those who vote and, and don't vote. And, and as someone who is an elected official and as someone who ran you know, Latino Victory Fund, um, why do you think there's such a gap between like eligible voters and actual voters, and particularly within the Latino community? I mean, as, as, as basic as it may sound, it's because they're not, it's, they're not talking to us, right? They're talking at us. Um, they're assuming they know, or they take us for granted, like you're saying. That's why when you saw the candidate like in Bernie Sanders, um, and I wasn't necessarily endorsing him. I'm just giving him as an example because I was very, very um, pleasantly surprised. And my, the whole time that I've been in politics, I've never seen a candidate that took us so seriously and was very committed uh, to, to, to addressing us and to listening to us and making sure that the messaging was one that spoke to us in that direct way, you know? And so to see the level of enthusiasm of the Latino voters demonstrated that that's what we need to see more of. Right, that's what uh, that's what candidates have to be doing more of. And, and let me be very clear: when I'm talking about candidates, I'm specifically talking about Democrats, because uh, I am a Democrat and I'm not interested in supporting this fascist uh, president or the fascist GOP. That's the way I see it. Um, you know that they have to understand uh, the power of the diversity that we ex we have in this country. Latinos are part of that diversity, um, and that therefore the messaging and the speaking to us. Um, has to really be that nuanced as well. Um, and so that, to me, I think the example of, of Bernie and the effectiveness of that campaign uh, talks about that when you do speak to us in the right way or if you do make us a priority um, in, in crafting an agenda that involves us, you're going to see people go out and vote. So that's what we need, uh, that level of commitment um, from, from uh, Biden and Harris in this administration that, that, that they want to represent. Thank yeah. you for that. Oh, go ahead, Kenneth. I was going to say, I think that the, the difference in terms of the number of uh, Latino eligible voters that don't vote uh, is the consequence of what I would call like a triple whammy, right? First of all, uh, there's no outreach oftentimes telling these voters you need to vote. Then the second whammy is they're told go out and register and vote, but they're not told who to vote for and who are the candidates that are supporting the, that their community, right? And the third one is that monolithic concept that if I talk to a Hispanic and this is the message 
that I have put together for Hispanics, then it's of universal application, right? And I think that that's something that oftentimes the Democratic Party has, there's been a lot of pushback, right? Because Democratic Party has taken Latinos oftentimes for granted. And despite great progress, as Melissa was mentioning, you know, with candidates and campaigns like uh, Bernie Sanders, uh, we still see that reflected today in, in Biden's campaign, right? Uh, uh, this is, the, I would say, the first time that you start seeing that they're trying to target specific audiences within the Hispanic community in different ways with their messaging, right? And 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 so kudos for that, right? But it takes much more. There's a, there's a long way, road ahead. And, that's yes. it. And, and in making politics local, Kenneth, I'm going to start with you for this one, because you're in a unique position. You have members of your organization that are both Democrat, Republican. I'm not sure if you have any independents, but it, you have members. And, and I, I presume that these members or communicate me and work on policies, right? So how do you get across uh, a Latinx agenda for your legislators? And maybe you could step, go a step back and kind of tell us, like, what, what does your organization do for, for these Latinx electeds? Yeah, so let me, let me start first with the, the first part, uh, or the last thing you mentioned. Uh, so the National Hispanic Caucus of State Legislators is a uh, uh, non-partisan, uh, but more than that, bipartisan organization. And we have members, including independents. Uh, we have one in Puerto Rico, for example. Um, and we represent the interests of, of, of these legislators, but more importantly, the interests of the communities that they serve, right? It is a bipartisan organization in, in, all the way through uh, in terms of their leadership. Uh, but you'd be surprised, oftentimes, when we convene and talk about the issues, uh, they take off their dem or rep hat or lens, and they look at it as, as you know, how is this having an impact on our community, right? Having said that, uh, the majority of Hispanic legislators are Democrats. I can tell you that the trend has been downward for Republican uh, Hispanic state legislators. It used to be at its peak uh, probably like a 70, 30 percent uh, uh, balance. And now it's more like 90 percent Democrat uh, or just just above 90 percent uh, Democrat. Right. And so we're at this, you know, we're at the mercy of democracy in that sense. So our members are, uh, you know, what voters, what voters elect. Right. And so uh, but but it, but then again, at the end of the day, they have to sit down and 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 try to figure out what are the best policies that advance the best interests for our community, and so I invite you to go to our website to all of those uh, uh, watching, and you can see a lot of our resolutions tackling some of the toughest issues uh, that our community faces, and you'll see that the resolutions were approved bipartisanly and unanimously, right? And so it speaks a lot about. Uh, about our legislators, I wish that we could say the same thing to you know, in the grander scheme of you know the the the, late, the seven thousand plus uh, legislators uh, nationwide. And and talking about diverse, diversity and the need of local political power, Melissa, you you started many initiatives in New York City. And in giving credit where credit's due, you started an initiative 21 for 21 by 21 uh, to highlight the need for, for women in elected roles. Uh, can you talk about that a little bit and what's your vision or what was your vision when you did that? So um, I'm, I mentioned before that I'm a fervent believer in coalition building, right? Uh, but at the same time, you know, representation does matter in government. Let's be very clear about that, right? So in New York City, out of 51 council members in this most diverse city, uh, in the city that everybody takes a look at, you know, that can set an example. And when I went into office in 2006 and the city council, there were 18 women out of 21. I mean, I'm sorry, out of 51, still well below where it should be. Those 18, by the time I left the city council at the end of 2017, it went down to 11. Um, and so the issue of, of representation, 
uh, uh, in terms of women was was desperately lacking, right? So uh, the idea of 21 and 21, which I uh, established with two other colleagues at the in 2017, was that we wanted to really create a network of really pushing and encouraging women to consider running as a legitimate profession, right? Service is something that you should not be ashamed of saying that you know you want to do on behalf of your community, uh, your community, um, and so we established that and we have seen it grow and now in 2021 the idea is to elect no less than 21 women in 2021 right we wanted to make a catchy name uh we're not limiting ourselves to 21 we could do the whole 51 we're fine with that too um but the issue of 21 and 21 the um the the uh idea there is because next year which is our important year here in new york city election year we're electing our citywide officials like our mayor uh, city Council, we have term limits in New York City. About close to 40 out of the 51 members, maybe 43 if I'm not mistaken, are actually term limited. So it is an incredible turnover, uh, but that's an opportunity. So we have women candidates that are running in, in almost every single district, even including, you know, uh, retando, uh, going against some of the incumbents, for instance. So it really has created an incredible network. The membership gets to interview the candidates and then basically votes for them. It's become an incredible opportunity in a network. So I'm really proud of that um, effort and many other initiatives that we undertook in the, in the council, which it shows when I was speaker, which shows the importance of representation, right? I was the first Latina uh, to hold a position of citywide influence. I was elected by my peers. I was not elected citywide but I had a position of citywide influence. And therefore, um, it meant a lot to the Latino community to see themselves finally being represented at a citywide level in that way. Uh, and also that the policies that I adopted and I enacted and that I was pushing for, that I personally made priorities, uh, were based on the experiences as a Latina, as a woman of color, of representing a district that was low income, had a lot of public housing. So public housing became a real priority for me uh, as an advocating for that in the city. The issue of closing Rikers Island, um, knowing that communities of color are disproportionately impacted, right, by arrests and uh, and under overrepresented in the criminal justice system. So, the issue of representation is critical because those experiences are ones uh, that can help shape the direction of your budget as a city, the direction of your policies, what you prioritize, and what you are. Um, validating, right, where your moral values are as a city. So that that was a, an important moment for our community as well as Latinos in the city. Can I, if if I could just add to what Melissa is saying, uh, this is uh, I want to share with you some uh, important data when it comes to Hispanic state legislators. So right now across the nation, there's close to seven thousand five hundred state legislators in total. Twenty nine percent of them are women. 29%, right, which is completely unacceptable. But the good news within that is that Latinas are outperforming their peers. Mm. They're approximately 40% in, in amongst Hispanic state legislators. So, so in the United States, you can say that Hispanics elect more women to public office as a share of the total number of Hispanics elected than any other demographic group. Obviously, there is still, you know, challenges ahead, and there's still room for growth until there is, you know, uh, uh, fair representation of women, and that, uh, and uh, you know, something that is more representative of, you know, the, our composition, yep. right? Uh, but at least when it comes to uh, Hispanics, uh, women are doing better, and I think it has to do with trailblazers like Melissa, right? I mean, thanks to the fact that she became the speaker uh, in the city council of New York City, she paved the way so that now another generation is coming in, and you have folks like Jessica Gonzalez Rojas, you have Catalina Cruz, right, that are now running for office uh, in, in their states and in their cities. And, and highlighting that, can you talk about some of the initiatives, kind of your organization is doing? I know you guys have the Latina Lead Academy. What, what exactly is that? What's the goal there? Yeah. So, so we know that we we still have a long way to go, right? So, one of the things is, first of all, we recently amended our bylaws to make sure that we uh, not just talk the talk, but we walk the walk. 50% of our, according to our bylaws, 50% of our leadership has to be women. 
The second thing that we did was we entered into a partnership with Rutgers University and the Center for American Women in Politics. And every year as a pre-conference to our summit, we hold this academy to, to be able to build that pipeline so that more women run for office, so that more women that already hold office can aspire to become the speaker of the city council, right? Or a chair of appropriations committee, or even better that they can run for higher office, which would, which would automatically mean it's a loss for us if we lose them as a state legislator because they run for uh, say Congress or a governorship, but it's a gain for our community. And we've seen that happening more and more uh, in recent years with, with the, with, with the uh, incoming, the, the last few uh, members that have joined the Hispanic caucus in Congress, for example, many of them jumped from state capitals to the nation's capital, right? I did that institute, by the way. So yes, it's a great program. So that's a great partnership. Thank you. That's great. And and it's needed. And many times we have vulnerable people, maybe even people watching today who, who may not be US citizens. Uh, and, and Melissa, you, you, know, you started a conversation in New York City that really changed the way people talk about our undocumented individuals, right? You started talking about, well, why can't they vote and decide on budget, participatory budget? You started talking about why don't we let non-citizens vote in local matters, right? What, what was the thought process behind that? Look, humanity has no citizenship, right? Um, it, to me, uh, supporting our, our immigrant communities has always been a priority for me. You know, it's been front and center. Uh, it was when I was a council member. It became even more so of a priority when I was speaker, where we put forward and made a priority and invested taxpayer dollars uh, in creating a legal fund, for instance, for those who were facing deportation proceedings. They did not have right to counsel in the city of New York. We made it a right to counsel in the city of New York for, so that they would have access to a lawyer when they faced deportation proceedings. And in a time of Trump, that kind of service, right, that, that would became a lifeline for some families. Um, not every case was successful, but there was some success stories out of have, providing legal representation to those. We also created a legal fund, for instance, for un, um, the unaccompanied minors that at the time that we did that in 2014, 2013, um, it was that first wave, right? This is obviously before Trump. This was the first wave of young people, kids, his children, even infants that were coming over the border uh, to flee from harm and from violence. Um, you know, we can't forget that sometimes the policies that we enact as a country have repercussions in other countries, right? And so uh, people were fleeing horrific situations and families and mothers and fathers felt that the only thing that they could do was have their children come over the border unaccompanied. Um, and so we had a wave of those young people that were in New York City, for instance, that were ending up in, in, in court without any lawyers. Um, and a custodian and, and, you know, and sometimes it was a relative, sometimes it was not. It was, you know, so just the or sense of urgency. I just felt that um, I wanted to be a voice and that as a city, regardless of your status, you are contributing positively to the city. Um, and therefore we have a responsibility to support you, right? And that's the way we should see it. So some of the initiatives that we undertook when I was speaker, which are still there, um, are ones that have served as a model for other cities as well. And, and we're hoping, right, that when we change the administration and that we take over the Senate as well, that we really can enact these humane policies. Um, it's gonna take a lot of work, a lot of damage has been done, uh, but, we, but we need to reprioritize, we need to you know, demand that the, the Biden administration, Biden-Harris administration prioritize our immigrant communities and right the wrongs that have been inflicted. So um, I, I just was something that I just felt was what I needed to do. And I know that um, it gave voice and visibility to so many. And um, I would hear it when I would go into the communities or take the subway or ride the bus, you know, where people were constantly appreciative of that work that I was doing because they felt heard for the first time. Um, so that's the power of representation, right? We have a moral responsibility to utilize the platforms that um, we have humbly been in, uh, endowed with, right? To really uplift others. And, right. um, you know, that's really, really critical. Yeah, that, that's amazing. Kenneth, uh... We're going to open up soon to questions. So if anyone has a question, please put it in the chat or, or raise your hand so we could address you. But Kenneth, I'd like to start with you around, around legislation and policy, 
right? Like you're dealing with Latino elected officials on a day to day, right? How, how do you create or how does one go about creating uh, a Latinx agenda? And, and what does that look like? Well, actually, I'll share with you that we uh, just a few days ago, uh, the largest coalition of Hispanic organizations, the National Hispanic Leadership Agenda, just published its quadriennial uh, agenda, policy agenda. Uh, this is a convening of, of these organizations focusing on a wide array of issues, right? And, and, and making sure that whether it be the current administration of its reelected or the next administration, we need to make sure that we advance these policies. And oftentimes it's, it's not that easy, right? But, but at the end of the day, we have to really push and we have to advocate on, I mean, on, on so many issues that are critical to our communities. Things like, for example, comprehensive immigration reform. I mean, how is it that it's 2020 and we don't have that yet in place? This despite bipartisan support, right? And so it's issues like that that we need to uh, remain focused on, uh, continue working. Right now, I can tell you that NHGSL has been uh, uh, advocating for a pathway to uh, naturalization and citizenship to our farm workers, just like as if they were had volunteered uh, to serve in war, right? There, if you volunteer to serve in war, regardless of your immigration status, you are granted a pathway to citizenship, right? And so right now we have farm workers that are exposing their lives so that we can remain, that we, that, so that we have food at our tables and that we can, uh, you know, uh, go through this pandemic, right? Uh, and so we need to honor that. We need to thank them for that and recognize them as 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 the equivalent of wartime heroes, right? Uh, the other thing that we've been uh, focused on is in the disparities that things like COVID have brought to light, right? And we have done a lot of work around the impact of this and, and relief programs uh, to people in urban areas because Hispanics tend to be concentrated in urban areas. So we've been doing a lot of work around that. We're, we are glad to have uh, been able to work with members of Congress so that they would eliminate the, the poverty penalty that the initial $1,200 check was going to have for people under $23,000 were gonna get just half the check. Uh, but we still have an issue with the urban poor and, and, the, and the fact that using things like a, a, a universal poverty line has a disproportionate impact on Hispanics and on people of color in general, because they tend to be concentrated in cities like New York City. And, and thank you. At, at this time, I'd like to call our first question from a student. Uh, so I'm going to call on Alex Chen from the college. Uh, Alex, feel free to ask your question. Hi, everyone. Well, um, thanks so much for being here today um, and for being with us at Forum. Um, I guess my question is more kind of about tonight and the vice presidential debate. I'm just kind of curious to think what you think um, Senator Harris needs to do to um, reach out um, to the Hispanic and Latinx community. And if you also think that the Biden campaign right now is doing a good job or if there's room for improvement. I want to you want to you want to start? Kenneth? Sure. Uh, I think, well, let me start by saying that, first of all, there was already excitement, uh, particularly with Senator Harris nomination in the Hispanic community. If you look at polls, Se Senator Harris was polling better as a running mate amongst Hispanics as compared to a generic candidate. So there was already, the, 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 the Biden team already knew that that candidacy would generate a, a connection, right? And, and enthusiasm in terms of getting out the vote. I think that what's important is that the, or where there's room for improvement is for the campaign to, to speak to Hispanics as to what's at stake in this election. How, for example, just COVID, just take COVID for example, how Hispanics have been particularly impacted in terms of uh, you know, uh, getting COVID in terms of the number of deaths Right. In terms of the types of jobs that Hispanics have, 
right? You have to make that connection by saying, look, somebody, either you have, you or somebody in your family perhaps has contracted COVID, you or somebody in your family has lost their job because of COVID, you or somebody you know has a bodega and had to close permanently because of COVID, that's how it has impacted our community. You talk like that, and that's when it make, you make the connection and say, I need to vote. That's, um, you know, Alex, thank you so much. I think it's a good, good question. Look, let's be, let's be honest, right? The, the situation between uh, a Pence and Harris is not going to be like a Trump and Biden, meaning the, how disruptive Trump is, right? You're not going to see what Pence become a Trump in terms of that demeanor. So she has a real opportunity, right, to really present the case as to why this administration is gonna bring the country together and really speak to that diversity, being able to talk specifically about examples. I've been appalled, to be honest, that there has been so minimal conversation about immigration. And not that that's the only issue that matters to our community, but think about how, you know, the, the most, one of the most visible, right, um, uh, representations and vile and violent of this administration is ripping those children apart from families at the border. That was in the news for so many months. That was front and center and continues to be something that is dominating in our, in our community. And it has not been discussed at all. It wasn't discussed, wasn't even mentioned in the, in the debate in any way. No recognition, right, of our humanity as a community by even mentioning something that is so vile and that continues to happen to us and the women who are being sterilized and the women that are being operated on in the detention center. So there has to be an acknowledgement in the responses and in the plan that's gonna be presented that really demonstrates the inclusion Right, that this administration, uh, that the, the campaign of Joe Biden talks about. And so we need to see that exemplified through um, examples. Now, clearly, me as a Puerto Rican, um, as someone whose island has been um, you know, hurt violently under this administration in particular, the lack of response after the hurricane, after the earthquakes, now with the pandemic, you know, the issue of, of self-determination. You know, there's so many issues that have been happening under this administration that we're not being recognized at, at all. So to me, I think, you know, that, that she will be excellent, I'm sure, because she has the experience and she's just been great in, in the Senate hearings. She, but they need to make the case, not be allowed to be distracted and taken off course, but present the case as to why this current administration is, is, um, is, uh, is not what we need to see and why theirs is going to be the one that's going to bring our country together. And I think that she has an ability to succeed uh, in a way that I believe did not happen in the presidential debate. And next, we're going to turn to Anand Hafez from, from also from the college. Hi, guys. Thank you so much uh, for being here. And thank you so much for having me. Uh, my name is Anan. I, I am a, a junior at the college. Uh, and I have sort of two uh, unrelated questions, but for all three panelists, so feel free to take them. Uh, the, first, the first thing I noticed was um, in recent polls, uh, Trump is doing better uh, this election than Clinton was, uh, or, or than he was uh, last election. Um, and I was wondering, you know, what sort of is driving that trend? Uh, that, and I know it's causing a lot of, you know, Democrat uh, people in the Democratic Party to, to sort of freak out a little bit. Uh, so what's causing that push for more let, uh, Latino voters to, to go to Trump? And then my second question uh, is a lot of uh, Latinos sort of reel at the idea of a, a socialist candidate or a Democratic socialist candidate. Uh, but of course, Bernie Sanders uh, in this past, you know, primary uh, resonated so well with the community. Uh, how do you how do you think he sort of circumvented that that fear in the Latino community? Uh, I'll, I'll start real quick. I'll say that don't trust the polls. Right, vote vote early is too early, and it's always going to depend on who's getting polled. Right. And understanding the Latinx community, many of us are at work when these calls are being made or are multitasking or during COVID are literally working to survive. Uh, the next thing is messaging. Right. We're an open group who, if you speak to us, will listen. And if you make sense and if you're talking about issues and talking about a plan, 
uh, we're going to listen and, and we might support that plan. I, I think, you know, you want to give the Latinx community the respect that you would give others and make sure that when you speak to us, like Melissa highlighted, you understand what our language is, not what your language is, but what our language is, and then how your policies fit into our language. Uh, and then I'll kick it over to, uh, I guess, Melissa, would you like to follow up on that? Yeah, just um, quick things. I think the issue of, of polls is, is important because it always is about, you know, who's asking the questions and what are the questions being asked. A lot of times the polls are not being done by us, you know, um, and but they're trying to, you know, measure what our opinion is. But just to like, there is, there is, and I was talking to, um, I was talking earlier about this, but NALEO, which is a national association of Latino elected officials, has been doing a tracking poll of Latino voters. And this week, um, it actually came out, there was a concern that, that Biden was not tracking as well with Latinos uh, versus Hillary, right? And, and, and the way she did in 2016. But that's shifting according to this tracking poll, which they're doing, it seems to be that they're doing it weekly um, to measure if there's any shift or change. And right now, um, the support for Biden is at 68% and 23%. And what's fascinating here is that among second generation Latinos, um, they're choosing Biden 71% to 19% according to this tracking poll, and that he's sparing even better with young voters. The younger voters are, are tracking um, more strongly to Biden than, than before. So uh, it's really interesting to see where that poll, that tracking poll is being done weekly, where it'll be next week or the week after. The second thing I'd say with regards to like Bernie, the, the success of Bernie, I think, is because he was actively engaging with us. He wasn't allowing other people to create the narrative within the Latino community of who he was. He was talking directly at us. And we had a direct communication with him, more so than we did with other candidates. And again, you know, I, I was I was supporting Elizabeth Warren, uh, you know, in the primary. So it's not like I'm, you know, giving deference. But you got to give credit where credit is due. So he, the narrative Bernie was creating with the Latino community was a direct conversation as opposed to allowing others to dominate a narr narrative and creating an image of Bernie in the Latino community. And that's the way at least I see it. Um, and I think there was value. You know, people were going to the polls in support of him because they're like, he took the time, you know, whether they were receiving a text from him or a phone call or they were being touched directly by the campaign. That's an example that should be followed and should be analyzed and followed by other campaigns, I think. I don't know. Anand, I would I would say that what you, you you bring a very important point, and that is, you know, you cannot take the Hispanic vote for granted, and you cannot automatically think they're going to vote Democrat or you know, because at the end of the day, uh, and there's plenty of evidence of that. You know, if you look at uh, uh, previous elections, uh, President George W. Bush got reelected with 44 percent of the Latino vote. That's significant, right? Uh, and so, but I I agree with Melissa that uh, the polls are a little bit misleading right now. They're not really polling the Hispanics, and I would say that uh, Hispanics are overwhelmingly favoring uh, Biden. You also have to then look at it more from a you know state by state because then when you do that breakdown, then that changes uh, dramatically, right? Uh, you probably have uh, Biden having a tougher time in Florida, particularly with, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, Cuban and Venezuelan communities there. But that, even that is changing, right? Uh, and the other thing that I would mention is uh, they need to bring out uh, Senator Harris more to connect with the Hispanic community. And these are the topics that I would say that they need to cover and touch on if they want to really you know, engage our community. Healthcare, healthcare, healthcare. That's the first topic, right? Uh, the second one, obviously, immigration policy. Uh, the issue of entrepreneurship, because Hispanics are the engine of entrepreneurship in this country. Uh, issue of minimum wage and poverty. Climate change, right? Hispanics yeah tend to live in places like California, Florida, that have been impacted by the effects of climate change. And uh, on the issue of climate change, then I would add the last topic, and very important one, the treatment, or mistreatment rather, of Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria, which mm -hmm. is saying that you, 
it, that didn't just impact and hurt Hispanic uh, uh, Puerto Ricans, right? Like myself, it hurt every Hispanic that watched that on the news unfolding. It wasn't just the throwing the paper towels. I mean, that's the that's the you know, that you keep. But it, it's just the fact that you go now to Puerto Rico and there are still houses that only have a blue tarp on their rooftop, right? If you talk about those issues, they will connect. They will connect and they will come out and vote. Thank, uh, thank you, Ken, Kenneth. Uh, I'm sorry, now I'm gonna turn to another student now and thank you for your question. Uh, Emmanuel, uh, please feel free to ask your question. Hello there, uh, my name, thank you so much for a great discussion tonight. Uh, my name is Emmanuel. I'm a senior at the college and, and I'd like to ask about the role of the Spanish language uh, in outreach to the Latinx community. Um, I think that I'm, I'm thinking especially of the presidential debates, for example, like in 2016, there was kind of a, a, a dispute between Mar Ted Cruz and Marco Rubio in the GOP debates on speaking Spanish to voters. Um, much was made about Tim Kaine's ability to speak Spanish and reach out to voters in the 20, or, as part of Hillary Clinton's campaign. Um, I was just wondering what the role of Spanish language outreach is in uh, kind of dealing with the Latinx and Hispanic community and, and speaking with them on their issues. Uh, and is there a point where it becomes almost seen as like pandering or, or something of that nature, where it's less helpful than, um, than it should be? Well, it depends on how you do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, I don't know if people remember, I don't know if, 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 um, if, if Kenneth, if you had seen the article, there was an article during the height of the Democratic primary where they actually, um, the reporter had actually was looking at the websites of all the Democratic candidates and looking at the Spanish version. And like the majority of them were using Google Translate. I mean, it was appalling, right? So if, if you're going to do it that way, half-assed, then, you know, it is pandering. Let's be honest, right? You might as well not do. It's better to do nothing than to do that. If you're genuinely doing it, right? Um, and I think at this point, in terms of not only Latinos but also other languages as well, because of the and especially in terms of where you're doing outreach, um, you have to be really genuine and put the resources into that. It has to be a real priority because when you're in the Latino community, speaking of monolithic, you also have different generations, right? The older generation predominantly will speak in Spanish. The younger generation is probably going to be more fluent or more, feel more comfortable in English um, or a mixture of both, right? So, so it depends. And that's the real, uh, really getting into uh, the understanding of who we are is to take the time and put in the resources into it to make it genuine and not make it as kind of a pandering thing. Because when you pander, it's when you don't take us seriously. And we're 32 million, uh, you know, we're the largest voting bloc now this this election cycle. You know, we're way past the point where we should be pandered to or where we should not be taken seriously. And we have to demand respect. That's the other thing and not be afraid to criticize where criticism is due. And, and so that to me is, is the distinction. So that's what I would say. I would also highlight that America has no official language. Right. And America has has a duty where you colonize people who speak a certain language to provide individuals information who are citizens in that language. And the Voting Rights Act, Section 203, calls for individuals in this country, many who are English limited proficient. So we need to make sure that we're reaching out to everyone. Um, and Kenneth, do you have anything to add to, to Manuel's question? No, I would just add that obviously, you know, for many Hispanics language, it continues to be a barrier, right? And so it's important to be able to provide information, not just on how to vote, but, you know, being able to talk about the issues uh, as much as possible in their language. And so even if the candidates are not able to, to speak Spanish themselves, it, that's when surrogates become crucial, right? right? having folks that can speak the language and can talk about the issues and the and the policy solutions and proposals that each candidate has, I think it's key. And it also has to do with authenticity, right? Um, I think you saw that if you go back in 2016 and you look at the Republican primary, for example, and you had attempts by Ted Cruz and Marco Rubio trying to speak Spanish, one came across as authentic and one didn't. And that's because one of them, despite uh, any differences you may have with, with, say, Senator Marco Rubio, but one thing you can't take away from him, and that is his pride, his pride of being Hispanic, 
right? He, he doesn't shame away from it. He's very, he owns it, right? That, the, 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 the fact of being Hispanic. You can't necessarily say the same about Senator Cruz. And so that's, that's where you see the difference in terms of authenticity. Thank you for your question. And, and now, uh, Melissa and Kenneth, before we wrap and, and turn it over for, for final thoughts and comments, I'd like to give you an opportunity uh, to share any any words of wisdom, advice, any thoughts uh, for for our viewers and students? I mean, I think we've said a lot tonight. I think, you know, I, I, um, I'm someone who genuinely uh, believes in um, in having communities, you know, speak for themselves. I'm not here to speak at young people and tell you what's in your best interest, right? Um, but I can just share why I'm voting, right? Why I feel so compelled to be involved in electoral politics, why I believe it's important to share with people in my community about why they should be voting, right? The power that it brings. And just alone, you know, that when we flex that electoral muscle, especially now that the Latino, Latinos will be the largest voting bloc in this election cycle, we can be the ones, right, to swing that scale um, in favor of taking this fascist uh, Trump out of office and to take all that GOP with him as well, the complicit enablers. Um, this is really the, the soul of our country, right? The, the democracy is being ripped away from us uh, as we speak and um, we're being dehumanized as people of color. And we can't stand for that. We have the power to make the difference. Um, we have to take that power um, and wield it and use it for good. And that means building a more uh, just and equitable society. And I truly believe that. And I will work to make uh, uh, people listen. And those of you that align with the progressive politics, um, Puerto Rico is not a political football, right? We should not be hearing uh, pundits talking about Puerto Rico, all oh, that the Democrats should force Puerto Rico to be a state because it'll give us to Democratic senators. We have to, so we, those of us that have come from marginalized communities should understand oppression. And we need to allow people who have been oppressed and colonized to be able to verbalize and express for themselves what the future is and what their future should be. So it is about supporting a process of self-determination, not trying to force a particular point of view uh, on a people who have been colonized for so long. So that's what I'll say. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Kenneth. Yeah, uh, I agree with uh, what Melissa was saying. So what I will do is, uh, just like she mentioned, I'm not going to tell you uh, what to do, you know, but I'm going to ask just one favor. Uh, and that is, you know, you're a member of the Harvard community, right? And so in your networks, amongst your peers, amongst family, friends, you're very well respected because of the fact that you're currently studying at Harvard. And I think that you all have a duty to better inform people on what's at stake in this election. There's a lot of fake news, needless to say, and you have an opportunity to correct, to call out and say, this is, you, you retweet something, I say, this is wrong, this is incorrect. Voting, the voting in this state, you, these are the deadlines. You need, you have a duty to do that. Um, you know, and, 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 you know, when I remember back in the day when I was a student, I wanted to change the world, right? And so if you do that, you are changing the world. You're just doing it one vote at a time. Every time you have the opportunity, try to empower a vote, try to educate a voter. That's my, that's my ask. Thank you. And, and before turning it over to, to the director of the Institute of Politics, I'll, I'll just add, you know, we're all empowered to inform individuals of right and wrong. Uh, we all have a platform. We all have a voice. And America, in order for it to continue to move forward, needs students, needs coalitions, needs individuals to just share their stories, share your vulnerabilities. And if you're eligible to vote, vote, <laughs> create your voting plan. If you're not eligible to vote, find somebody who is eligible to vote and make sure that they vote as your surrogate, right? There are so many different ways to be involved in this upcoming election. And I'll be remiss if I didn't mention, please fill out the census. The census is literally the foundation of how our democracy works, how resources are sent out. 
um, and everyone on here has access to technology where someone you know may not have the same access. So please help somebody fill out their census as well. And at this time, I'd like to turn it over to the director of the Institute of Politics, uh, Mark Guerin. Well, thank you very much, Marie. And to Melissa and to Kenneth, um, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for your uh, perspectives and your own life uh, journeys and your, the lives of consequence that you have led. Uh, so we thank you most sincerely. Um, special thanks to Jorge as a great moderator and a great fellow here at the Institute of Politics and Luis for starting us off and sharing his narrative, which was so um, important for us all, particularly this month as we observe and celebrate Latinx and Hispanic Heritage Month. Tonight's forum was one way we have done that. We're grateful that Jorge brought Jonathan uh, Jays Green, Senator Warren's Latinx outreach coordinator to his study group. We were thrilled at a pizza and politics session to have Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's district director, a graduate of the college, uh, Maribel Hernandez Fernanda uh, Rivera with us uh, at the pizza and politics, our young alum panel, focusing specifically on the journeys of Latinx, Hispanic students, uh, and this Friday, where we will welcome uh, council member uh, Richie Torres uh, as uh, he prepares for his next election, should he be uh, elected. So it's, um, it's been a busy month and an important month. We hope our students will take advantage of our social media platforms, where IOP students are sharing their reflections on prominent uh, Latinx and Hispanic uh, models of, of, of lives well led that they can reflect upon that inspire them. So a lot going on, uh, as we say at the Institute of Politics, this is every day counts between now and the election day. They're every day at the Institute between our fellows like Jorge and others to the forums like tonight, to pizza and politics. There is a place where you can find uh, discussions about politics, challenge your own thinking uh, and learn a lot. We hope you'll join us tomorrow night for a forum at 6 p.m. where we welcome John Hennessy, who's the former uh, president of Stanford uh, University and the chair of Alphabet. He'll be in conversation uh, with David Gergen from the Kennedy School. That's uh, tomorrow night uh, at 6 p.m. But again, I, I leave with my gratitude to our great panel and to Jorge for, for moderating it so well. Thank you all for joining us and good night.